Hi everyone, I'm Marisol Nichols. Now you may know me as an actress from film and television. What you may not know is that I have been working in the anti-trafficking movement for over a decade. I've been honored to work alongside law enforcement as an undercover operative, both in the US and abroad, to help put bad guys in jail and help rescue some women and children. I created my foundation for a slavery-free world and this podcast to help prevent you or your loved ones from ever falling prey to these predators. Thank you, and welcome to the Marisol Nichols Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Marisol Nichols Podcast. Now, I have a very special guest with me today. He has been in the sheriff's office working in law enforcement for over 27 years. He worked homicide, terrorism, and most recently, human trafficking, which he's won numerous awards for his work. Please welcome Sergeant Alan Wickett. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, mm -hmm. and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share some great information about human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited. So I, I've only known you like a year, but I feel like I've known you for a long time. Um, and so I can't wait for my audience to hear everything that you, you have to say. So let's, let's dive in. When you started with the sheriff's department, were you in homicide, terrorism, or how did you how did you go from that into human trafficking? So, as most people that get into law enforcement, you start on the road. So mm -hmm. I started in patrol okay. and yep. uh, worked patrol not very long, and then ended up going into our detective unit, became an inspector, uh, an investigator for several years, and in that investigator role, done major crimes, uh, property crimes, uh, crimes against persons. Mm -hmm. uh, child abuse, so all of those areas of investigation. And then more recently, as human trafficking began to really take the spotlight like it is, yep. uh, after the TVPA was passed and human trafficking became kind of a criminal statute, mm -hmm. um, moved into the human trafficking space. And that really motivated me because I could not believe that in the United States of America, we were still buying and selling people. Yep. That infuriated me. And so that's why I focused on human trafficking and, and stayed there until the end of my career. That's amazing. Explain a little bit what the TVPA is. It's a bill that passed. It's a federal bill, but explain that just a little. Well, what's interesting and a lot of people don't understand about human trafficking is as a, as a chargeable criminal statute, it's relatively a young crime. Right. Because it's only in the year 2000 when Congress passed the TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, yep. which gets renewed about every three years or so, and they're in the process of renewing it now. Yep. Um, and they're calling it the Frederick Douglass Trafficking oh, okay. Victims Protection Act. Uh, so it, it gets renewed about every three years, but it's relatively young. Right. You know, Florida didn't pass their human trafficking statute until three or four years after the TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which is a federal law. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's relatively a young crime. Yeah. And I think as law enforcement and community, uh, we're still trying to wrap our hands around what it really is, yeah. how to deal with it. So it's, it's relatively young, but that's what the TVPA is. So most people, like you said, have no idea, and I talk about this all the time, that this is happening right underneath their noses. This is you're a sheriff in Florida. So, you know, this is where people go for vacation. Right. This is where people go to retire, you know, and, and you don't work out of Miami where you might think, oh, it's, it's only in Miami. So can you sort of explain a little bit about what it looks like in Florida for sure. our listeners? Sure. So in Florida, we, we really go after two forms of human trafficking. There's labor trafficking and then there's the commercial sex trafficking. Labor trafficking has kind of been ignored to a large yeah. degree, uh, but we have a lot of that in Florida as well. So we have the commercial sex trafficking, which makes the most money, mm. uh, but the most victims obviously are in, are in labor trafficking. And in Florida, because we're such a high tourism state and mm -hmm. depend on tourism, a lot of trafficking, both labor and the sex trafficking, happens around the tourism industry, mm. whether that's large scale uh, sporting events, whether that's going to be large conventions, which we have a lot here in Florida. Uh, all of those kind of tourist attracted uh, theme parks yeah. all bring in these pimps who are bringing their stables in and then of course trafficking them out on the street. So uh, so we see a lot of migration of human trafficking into Florida. Mm. You have both those who are obviously uh, citizens of Florida, but you have a lot that come into Florida as well. So we right. see both forms of that uh, as we work this. So when you're talking about 
whether that's nail salons, uh, landscaping, construction, um, agriculture, uh, hotels, motels, and then your brothels, which right. operate, we have a large epidemic, for lack of a better term, yeah. of human trafficking that's happening right here on the streets of Florida, happening in every community, every city, uh, across the rural areas of Florida. We have an issue in Florida that issues human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say on the streets, people think of, oh, well, you, it only happens, like sex um, trafficking only happens with girls that you see walking down the street. That's not the case at all. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so what was traditionally uh, called street tracks or blades or pushes or pens or whatever the name that is being used uh, to utilize it was kind of that old traditional mindset of, of like you said, the, the, the woman walking down the street um, uh, dressed in a mini skirt or right. provocative, whatever that may be. And that was kind of the idea of what prostitution or trafficking was. And so most of our trafficking mindset is still kind of mired in the prostitution mindset, right? which I think is something that has to culturally change yes. in order for us to really get our, our hands around this. But what we're seeing now is that 60%, and this is an old stat, probably two or three years old now, so it's probably higher than this. Yeah. And I believe it is based on my experience. But 60% of trafficking is now happening online. You know, the most dangerous place for a child to be in America right now is alone in her bedroom with a digital device or his bedroom yep. with a digital device. The most dangerous place. In my day, that was a park, it was a movie theater, it was a mall. Those were the things that we were saying we need to guard against. And there's still a, a, a need to do that. Sure. On that field. But what about the digital space where we're actually inviting the predator into our lives, into our homes, into our bedrooms through a digital device. So the old mindset is always happening on the street, on a street track or a blade is not necessarily true anymore. It's right. actually happening right in our own homes through a digital device. You know, I've done a lot of episodes on that. And I always say like our white, you know, the old white van, yeah. where are the white, white van? The white van is now the internet. Absolutely. As you mentioned. And so, you know, I've talked about these about these things in the past, but there was something that you mentioned that I don't think I've ever actually, we've ever addressed on here. And you mentioned brothels. And people go, what do you mean a brothel? Like, like in the wild, wild west when they had brothels? What do you mean there's brothels in America, in Florida, in, what do you mean? Can you tell what you mean by that, but then also some examples of what that actually looks like now? So uh, so brothels, are brothels are still in existence? And the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, they're probably more prevalent than most people think. So I'll, I'll give some examples. Yeah. Um, one of those could be a, a home, a home in a community, a home in a neighborhood that has a lot of traffic going in and out of it, uh, females coming in and out, males coming in and out. Um, what used to be referred to as a drug flop house or a stash house has some of the same characteristics, but it's actually a brothel that is operating right in a neighborhood. We had a, a brothel some years ago that was happening in Pinellas County, and it was happening just maybe two blocks from the police station. And it was a full-fledged brothel <laughs> that was happening right down the street. Um, and, and again, that was back several years ago. But it's not just the home, it's not just the brothel. You know, there's no advertisement on the front door right. that says brothel or saloon, like we think of the old Wild West. But now we're seeing some of them operating as legitimate businesses, massage establishments, Yep. what we refer to as IMBs, the illicit massage businesses. So those illicit massage businesses that are happening in all of our communities yep. are absolutely brothels. I've been in them. Mm -hmm. I've inspected them, I've looked at them, I've seen the cameras inside the rooms, I've seen the women who are being exploited in, they have a business license, but they're really a brothel that's masquerading as a massage establishment. Yeah. So you have those that are going on, you have uh, the homes that are being converted into, into brothels. So when we talk about brothels, they are active and numerous in our communities today. I think, thank you, I, I think that it's the weirdest thing it's almost like everybody knows. Everybody knows. Yes. Why is there, like it's normal for a massage parlor, usually in the middle of 
sometimes in the middle of nowhere or just on the side of like a major street in a strip mall. But the massage parlor, it's okay for all the windows to be blacked out. Yeah. Why? And it's okay for that to be operating at two, three, four in the morning. And people like they like they know. They're like, oh yeah. But they don't what they don't understand is that there are women and girls and underage girls being forced to perform these things. This is not voluntary. And it's one of the things that I pisses me off so much because it's so prevalent. Yes. I'm like, how is this okay? How is this allowed to go on? It's one of the first conversations you and I just went, blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah, when we met on, and you found some really interesting things. Can we can we talk about that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, tell me because you did a lot on this, and I was so happy that we talked about it. Can you tell me sort of what you found and like the location of those things and who's operating it and how they switch out the girls, all all of that stuff. A couple of examples. Uh, one of the areas that, that we ended up investigating, uh, uh, the task force that I headed up, uh, we went into a barber shop, a mm. barber shop that was actually a brothel. Wow. Now it was operating in a, uh, a high-end office complex where insurance companies and dentist offices were operating and on the end unit was this exotic barber shop. Wow. An exotic barber shop. When we went into there, and, and we had, had got a couple of um, leads on that and, and a couple of um, people that were saying something's not right about this. Mm. So we went into it. The first thing you do is you notice that you can only get through the front door if somebody buzzes you in. <laughs> what barber shop do you have to stand at a door and buzz? The second thing that we found out, it was all male clientele that right. was going in. The other thing that we found out from an insurance company that happened to have an eye view of, of the entranceway as we talked to the folks, they would tell you, you know, we've always talked about it, kind of laughed about it because men would go in with their hair one length and when they come out, it was the same length. And we were like, yeah, something's not right. right. And I'm thinking, why are we not getting these kind of calls if it's instead of laughing it off? Because the fact of the matter is behind those closed door were women in this case, Colombian women, but women behind these closed doors who were being exploited. And that's not okay. No. When we hit the front door uh, of this establishment, the back door flung open and they ran out and flung something over the fence. And when we went there, it was a trash can full of condoms. It was where you go in and sit down in quote unquote a barber's chair and have a drink. And then you're able to order from a menu right. that it's not okay for this to happen. We would go into the, these illicit massage businesses and you would start that conversation with some of the women that were there and oftentimes they were scared. Right. They're terrified. They're afraid to say one word to you. They're on camera. They're being videotaped. I mean, somebody's watching them. But they're so terrified. And if you do start making a little bit of a rapport and start breaking through, maybe you bring somebody in that can speak Mandarin Chinese or, or speaks the language that they speak. And so you start that dialogue. The next day you go back, they're gone. Two or three days later, there's another set uh, that's coming in. So they're rotating them in and out. And, and we know that as, as, as fact. My point is this, is when do we collectively, law enforcement, community, churches, faith community, business community, name the community that makes up our society. When do we come together and say, this just isn't okay? It's just not okay for people to be exploited like this mm -hmm. and to be traumatized like they never recover from this. And so why should we just laugh it off right. as though it's kind of a funny thing that happens on an end unit of an industrial park? It's not funny. No. It's, it's dangerous, it's traumatic, and it's dehumanizing. And all of those things are enough for us to take it serious. 100%. And my biggest thing was, was seeing the shock on people's faces when they didn't realize that, wait, you mean those women and girls are not there voluntarily? Oh, yeah, yeah, no. It's like, no. No, they're paying off debt bondages. Uh, Explain what that is. So a debt bondage is when, uh, and I'll just use an example, if, if someone's coming from China and being brought into the United States to work in these establishments, those triads and cartels that are doing this, we all know who's behind this, the, these dangerous players uh, that are doing this on a global scale, when they come in, most of the time these, these women are men 
in, in many cases, don't have the money to pay for all the visas, to pay for all the travel, to pay for all the documents to come into the United States. So these cartels, these triads, these criminal organizations will pay to get them here. And they get here with a $20,000 debt bondage or so. That $20,000 that they don't have um, has to be paid off before they can actually make any money. They never pay it off. Right. They're charged for their clothes, they're charged for their food, they're charged for a place to sleep, which is oftentimes inside the establishment itself. Um, they have to pay, they never pay this off. They're under a debt bondage for the rest of their working life that they're right. here. The other piece that's, that's involved is oftentimes their families are, are being threatened in their home country. Mm. And so they're, they're not only under a debt bondage, but they're under coercion. And that coercion is that if you don't do what we tell you to do, we still got people here that's going to hurt you. It's it's one of the most diabolical things I've ever seen. Yeah. I've seen their pets threatened. <laughs> uh, one survivor told me the story about, um, and she had a special needs child. And she tells the story, uh, and sometimes we'll do trainings with me. It's, and I don't want to tell her story for her. It's her story to tell. But the broad stroke of that story is, is that when the trafficker came in and put his foot on the neck of her dog and started grinding that little dog's head into the until it was squealing oh. and looked at her and said I'll do this to you and your child if you don't do exactly what I'm going to tell you to do she was terrified mortified do you think she showed up at the private party that night right. to dance and to have unspeakable things to happen to her inside of a marina absolutely she did and this happens in our communities it happens in the shadows of our businesses and it's not okay <laughs> You know, it's thank you for telling the broad strokes of her story and thank you, thank you for touching on this because it is the thing that fires me up the most. It's right there. It's down the street. The brazenness of these criminals to have a brothel two blocks from a police station. Yep. They're, they're so, I mean, I guess brazen is the word, but they're so just like, oh, it doesn't matter. Like untouchable they feel they do that no one's coming to get them and you do something that i love which is you travel around the united states educating law enforcement different entities in law enforcement just to teach them what to look for yeah because that's how fast the problem is growing and how much law enforcement just needs to catch up yeah. like I, I always get the glib response why aren't the police doing anything and it's like that's a glib response yeah they're still catching up to this. We're still figuring this out, whether it's law enforcement or legislative or whatever. So I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. And you said something earlier, in, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but it takes a village. It takes everyone. It's not just their job. Right. Or someone else is going to do something about this. Right. Everyone needs to do something about this. Everyone needs to report it, to make a phone call, to say that's not okay, to do something rather than, as you said, or walk by and snicker or like, uh -huh, prostitute. Yeah. They have no idea what's behind that. That's a human being. Exactly. And sometimes we're quick to throw labels on until we can't see the person anymore. Yeah. I, I was in one of our strip clubs and in that strip club, um, we were able, and I pulled back the curtain in the VIP room and saw the act of prostitution happening right there. I mean, it was, it was, it was clear. And so the question was asked of me, what are you going to do with, with the guy, the buyer? Right. And in my view, the buyer has been let off uh, way too easily. Thank you. There's no accountability to a buyer. Uh, a buyer is getting by with this. Uh, if they get caught, which is rare, uh, they're getting a slap on the wrist mm -hmm. and everybody kind of laughs and says, oh, it's just the oldest, it's the oldest, you know, oldest profession, profession yeah, in the world. Start hearing this just flippant. I know. But if you look at her, you know, she, she's jumping off of him and she's putting her, her little outfit, trying to put it back together again. And, and of course she sees me there and she begins to weep. And, um, uh, you know, she's crying and her mascara is coming down. And, and uh, I'll never forget, Marisol, this, this was one of the memories I can't shake, is she had a head cold that day. And I'll never forget looking at her and those, those lights, you know, this, those lights that they have in the VIP rooms that yeah. kind of soften the mood and the music going and, and her nose was running into her mouth and it was just really a pitiful 
sight. Here was a, a, a woman who needed to be at home taking care of herself, and yet here she is working because somebody's making her do this. And uh, she said, I know I'm going to jail. And she said, but before I do, can I show you uh, something? And I said, sure. And she clicks on the screen of the, of the phone and turns to me, and it's her two children. And they look to be three, maybe two, a little boy and a little girl. And she goes, please don't tell my kids what I do. And I'm telling you, I'm in full gear. Yeah. And I'm broken. Yeah. Please don't. That should tell all of us, they don't want to be there. Thank you. They don't want, this is not the life they envision. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not the life they want for their kids. They're so embarrassed, they don't want their kids to know. Right. One of the statements she made to me is something I have heard over and over and over again as we work with survivors. As I've worked with kids coming out of homes and I've carried them in my, my arms, little boys and little girls who have been ravaged in ways we can't imagine. This woman in the VIP room of a strip club looked at me and said, I don't even know why you're talking to me because nobody sees me. Right. It was the cry of, a, of humanity. Right. This ripping cry out of a human soul that's nobody sees me. Everybody wants to be seen, right? but nobody sees her. And, and it's true. We had put whore and prostitute and tweaker and slut and stripper and all of these labels, one right after the other, until finally she, she no longer existed. Right. It was just a label. And until we're able to peel that back, and that means all of us in our community, from law enforcement to prosecutors to judges to business, everything that we've Everybody. been talking about, until we're able to strip back the labels again and see the human being, mm -hmm. the humanity of someone who's being ravaged, uh, that's when we'll really make a difference because that's when we'll hold accountable those who really should be held accountable for the, for the absolute trauma mm -hmm. that's being inflicted on these victims. Exactly. 100%. And you mentioned something, it's the buyer. Absolutely. Drives the demand. You would not have women and children in this situation if you didn't have demand. Absolutely. And it kills me that the buyer gets a slap on the wrist or sometimes gets let go. Absolutely. It's unreal to me. Yeah. It's unreal to me. You yeah, can, you were going to say you something. You can buy a human being and you can buy a human being today, an adult. You can buy a human being and if you get caught, which is rare, you'll be charged with a misdemeanor. Yeah, nothing. In California, it'll be anonymous. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And no here, one even needs to know. Uh, and here, they I've seen them plead it down to a disorderly conduct. A disorderly conduct for buying a human being and ravaging her? Doing what you want to her? So the point being is, is until we get serious about the demand side of this, yeah. we'll, never, we'll never solve the supply side until we get serious about the demand side. We can go after traffickers. We can arrest them. And I, we should. should hold them accountable. We can recover victims, and we should, and give them all the services that they deserve. But until we get serious about the buyer who's driving the market, who's putting the $150 billion in, yeah. who's driving that, that commercial sex out of $99 billion or so, when, until we get there yeah. and start really going after demand, uh, we're in a losing battle here. I agree 100%. I feel we are maybe two, three years away from having this crap legalized. And, and that's, They're trying hard. Absolutely, they are. I have to say, I, I, I want your opinion on this. I have my own opinion on it, but I want your opinion on Governor Ron DeSantis passed, signed into law, I believe it's the death penalty. Up to, could be. Up yeah. to the death penalty for getting caught, essentially raping a child, yeah. but in you know the other world, it's like, oh, well, buying sex from a child. Same thing. How do you feel about that? So, it, having seen what I've seen, um, I certainly, I certainly was was okay with that. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'll tell you, I, and I hear people they're critical of that. They're mm -hmm. oh no, that's that the punishment doesn't meet the crime. It doesn't. Well, the way that law was written was there had to be some very extenuating circumstances in order to get that. It, it, it may not ever be applied. Maybe it will be. Mm -hmm. But the point is, it sends a message mm -hmm. that in Florida. We're going to protect our kids. And right. if you come after our, our national treasure, which is our children, right. if you come after them, we as a society, we as a community, we as a, as, a, as a government, we as a state are going to look at you and say, you can't do that to our kids. Right. And you can get the death. It sends a message. It's not an automatic death penalty. Correct. But it's saying that you can. You could get there. And when you've got a country where most of the time, even if you do buy a kid 
for sex, most of the time, you still get a slap on the wrist and let go. And whenever I, I lecture about this, and I'll show footage, you know, of, of opposite I've done where the man is buying a, yes. a 12-year-old girl or a 9-year-old kid, and they ask, well, what did they get? They're horrified to hear how minuscule the punishment was for them. So to me, it's a deterrent. It is. Because there's no, if there's no consequence, why would you ever hold in your ethics enough not to do that? Right. If you know there's like nothing to yeah. it. And, and it's so true. And what you said is, I think that is the greater point. The mm. greater point is, is where do we make our statements? Right. You know, where do we, where do we draw a line and say, yeah, it's a, that's a bridge too far. And if, it, if it's not our kids, then where? Exactly. What, what does that line, what's that bright red line look like? So, so the governor, I think with, with signing that into law, he, he painted a really bright red line mm. and said, here in Florida, um, our kids are untouchable and you should know that. And if you choose to cross that line, then there's going to be a punishment that's going to meet the horror of what you're really doing. I don't care what side of the aisle you are on. If you are protecting children, I'm down for that bill. I'm down for that law. I'm down for supporting you no matter what. Because as you said, where's the line? Yeah. At, at what point do we say enough? Someone has to protect these children from being raped. Yeah. And you and I know we've talked about this. You sit on a legislative board. I've talked to you about possibly getting some more laws passed or laws looked at. It's such a giant issue in state to state. Everyone, every state in America, because some of my audience is not from America, has different laws. But you'd be shocked at, for example, California and almost the opposite stand yeah. that I'm shocked. Yeah that they're taking. I, I recently read that they were looking at making the sex registry. These are convicted sex offenders who now have to sign up that I am a convicted sex offender and any parent, any school, any, anybody can go online and see if their neighbor is one, if the, their teacher is one, if anyone is one. And California was actually looking at making this anonymous because it violates the rights of the sex offender. Mm. I just don't, I just don't get it. Upside down. It's just totally upside down. So in Florida, what we ended up doing was kind of built on that idea of a sex registry, yep. sex offender registry, and we created a John registry. It's the first <laughs> in the nation. In fact, as far as I know, it's the only one in the nation still. That's shocking. And we, we put that together saying that if you purchase another human being in the state of Florida, solicitation, uh, if you buy another human being, and you're arrested for that, you go on a John registry. And this John registry is public facing, which means the public can, can search and see if your neighbor down the street has ever bought sex in the state of Florida. And so- and your, uh, Or your husband. Or your husband, or absolutely. Or your employee. Exactly. Or your new friend or your new boyfriend. Or, That's or right. the cop down the street. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's whoever. So if you, if you uh, go on this John registry, you have one opportunity to get off of it. And that is if you don't reoffend within, I think it was three years. If you do, you're on it for life, just like a, wow. a sex offender. So it's built on the same premise, Wow! but it's taking it to a different level yeah. of accountability and saying to the buyer, we're going to hold you responsible. That law is up for review next year. Um, that and I law? don't know they're going to keep it, but, but I hope so. Listen, I'm obsessed with that law. Anything I can do to help, I want to bring that law to California. It's, it's awesome. That's, that's accountability. It is. That's a consequence. Now there's a consequence for, it, it's illegal. People forget this is illegal. Still, Absolutely. you cannot do this. You can't buy another human being for sex. Right. It's still illegal, at least in a lot of the states in America. Exactly. So why shouldn't, why should we protect someone who's doing this. I totally agree. And, and I will tell you, you know, I've worked with a lot of or different organizations. I've interviewed a lot of different organizations and one for one for one for one, the survivors always tell me that the men who bought them, particularly even when they were under age and a kid, were fathers, 
pillars of the community. I've arrested these guys. Fathers, pillars of the community. Yes. Uh, even church clergy. Yes. And they they get away with it because no one knows they're doing this. Police officers. Thank you. Judges. Thank you. Uh, I, you, you name it. It goes across the board. Buyers doesn't know uh, a profession. A buyer is a buyer is a buyer. That's right. And the bottom line is, is that, and you mentioned that about survivors, in my experience with survivors, and, and you know, I've had the wonderful opportunity to have met dozens, if not hundreds of, of survivors and yeah. hear their stories. And they're the true subject matter experts, by yeah. the way, not me. They, they are. They're the lived experience uh, experts. What's interesting is is something that I hear almost a hundred percent, and that is the most violent person in their life was the buyer, not the trafficker. We wow. oftentimes think about the pimp with his cane, and you know he's beating on them, and all, all those. And sometimes that happens. So I don't want to diminish that. Yeah. But they will tell you over and over the most violent person was the that they buyer. ever encountered was the buyer, and yet we're not holding the buyer accountable. We go after the trafficker, get him. 10, 15, 20 years, and I'm all for that. Uh, that yeah. I'm not again, but the buyer, why are we not holding the buyer equally culpable? Thank you. For the trauma being inflicted on that human being as the trafficker is. And if the trafficker is going to get a felony and spend 15 years in federal prison, the buyer should as well because Agreed. they are violent. They're the driver of this, of this disease, and we have to get serious about holding them accountable. The most violent person in their life was their buyer. I don't think people realize that. Have no idea. But then you have to think they, that mentality is that I, I, I own this human being. Absolutely. For 30 minutes or an hour, therefore I can do whatever I want to them. Absolutely. And it's, it, it's heartbreaking. It is. It's heartbreaking. And I've heard, I've heard them say, say that. They, really? They'll talk about how that. The, the, the survivor will tell you that the buyers will tell them, say, no, you, I don't want to get crude, but our contract mm -hmm. that we made, our agreement was that I was going to give you oral sex. Now, all of a sudden, you want to rape me because I haven't consented to that. And the and buyer's mindset is, no, I've got you for 30 minutes or an hour. You're, I'll do whatever I want to. And who are you going to tell? Exactly. There's a lie that's being continually told by these organizations that want to legalize prostitution, but let's be honest, you're trying to legalize trafficking. Correct. You're calling it prostitution. You're legalizing, wanting to legalize trafficking. And this lie is perpetuated, and I hear other well-meaning people repeat it. And the lie is, oh, I'm empowered. The, the woman, I have the power. I'm choosing to sell my body. And it makes it seem like, you know, they'd like to march out these these you know, three or four women that are willing to say these things. And it looks like, oh, well, then who are we to tell women what they should and shouldn't do? If they want to sell their bodies for sex, it should be fine. Well, A, if they wanted to sell their body for sex, why do they need a pimp? Yeah. The power is in the buyer's hand because they own you. They do. For that 30 minutes or an hour, and they can do whatever the hell they want. And especially if we legalize this, yes. who are you going to tell? Exactly. And legalization is a cover mm -hmm. for trafficking. What I am for is I am for taking another look at the victim. And okay. instead of charging the victim with felonies like we're, we have traditionally done, we need to revisit that. Yeah. There's where we need to revisit. Agreed. Not making it legal. No. We need it. So that victim, what are we going to do with that victim? What are we going to do with that survivor? Instead of charging them with a felony, we need to be offering services, right. a way out, good, healthy employment, a, a, a path forward, a path out of, quote, unquote, yeah. the life. We need to be doing those kind of things and not this either decriminalizing or legalizing prostitution. Right. Both of those are bad ideas and have bad consequences. Hugely bad consequences. Yes. We did a whole episode um with Yasmin Bafa, who runs an organization called Rights for Girls out of DC. And she's delved into like, look, let's look at what's happened to the countries and the towns where this has been legalized, like yes. Amsterdam, like, yes. you know, like different areas. And as you mentioned, all it does is increase yes. crime, not even just in, in that, on that issue, right. but increases crime in general yep. in the area. And I, 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 so I'm glad that you mentioned that. We're going to wrap up soon, but I, I, you mentioned 
the survivors that you've worked with and the stories that you've heard. And I, I asked before you came on if you had a couple of stories that you'd like to share with us. Would you mind sharing those with now? Because I find that the audience, when you put a person or a face or a name to this issue, it's easier for people to comprehend it than just a generality of numbers. You know yeah. what I mean? Okay. It's so true. I, I, you know, there's a couple things that come to mind. Uh, one has a, in my view, a tragic ending, and the other uh, has a more of a hopeful ending. Um, Start the, with a tragic, because I want to end on hopeful. The, the youngest, the youngest um, victim that I personally have had the opportunity to interact with and be part of the recovery was a little eight-year-old girl. Uh, the eight-year-old girl, uh, and this is before we had the TVPA, so we didn't have a trafficking charge. Um, so we're investigating more of a child abuse at this point. Um, she was being trafficked as we know it now. Then we didn't have the, the language to put around that, but she was being trafficked uh, by her two uncles. Oh. Uh, men that should have protected her were selling her for six pack of beer, carton of cigarettes, and they would actually dress her up in a little birthday dress, and it was like a birthday date. That girl um, was so traumatized, um, so just just messed up. I don't I don't know what words to put it. Just so messed up because of all the trauma that had been inflicted on her for years, right. years. That even after recovery. And we didn't have services back then like we do now. We didn't have specialized services because, again, this was something we were unheard of. I mean, we, right. we didn't know what, didn't even have the language to put to it. A little girl that, that now tries to commit suicide and, and uh, will never function uh, in, in what we would describe as a normal way. Just a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, it's a face that haunts me to this day. Uh, and because I wished I would have had more tools back then uh, to be able to to do something to help her. And it just seemed like we really let her down. Uh, I w also would have loved to have gone back, as you mentioned, and track every single man. Yes. Who decided that this was okay to do with an eight-year-old girl. Yep. All just, of those monsters. What? Yep. You've what? destroyed a human being. Absolutely destroyed. Okay, and so, but that is what this looks like, and I know from is. my audience it's hard to listen to, but that is what this is. This is what we're trying to prevent. This is why I'm doing this. This is why he is doing this. This is why it is important, because enough is enough, and we need to just, just say no more. I, I, I totally agree. And then I, I flipped that to going back to the strip clubs uh, that we talked about earlier. So she's standing in, in the VIP room, the girl, the woman the, that we the mentioned. The woman that we mentioned earlier. So she's standing in the VIP room. She's she's crying. She shows me the picture of her kids. He's, Please don't tell my kids what I do. And we're at that moment. And I'm broken. Uh, my heart's broken for her because I realize she don't want to do this. This isn't what she woke up. And she's doing this because she feels there is no other path. Right. Every other door has been shut. And, and honestly, Marisol, that we have done this to them some to, as, at, to, as a to society. Large degree, as a society. Because... What, by charging her with 19 felonies on her record, can she get a house? The right. answer is no. Can she get into an apartment? The answer is no. Right. Can, can she work a decent job? The answer is no. Can she go to college? The answer is no. We've closed her off until now she feels trapped right. in this. And we what, punish her. We do because she's Not the man, Absolutely. but the her. And so yeah, she has no, now what? Mm -hmm. So she looks at me and she goes, uh, I know I'm gonna get arrested. And, and I happen to have, um, some folks with me who had went on this this operation with us because I wanted them to see what the dynamics were. And one of those happened to be a, a, a young lady. And I'll never forget the young lady tapped me on the shoulder and she said, can I go hug her? And I said, of course. And so she walks around me and she hugs her and in the middle of a VIP room and they just wept for a few minutes. It's just human to human. That's, yeah. that's what it was. Well, thankfully she didn't get arrested. You know, uh, we've got to do this differently. Instead, she got referred to services. Uh, services were able to come in and begin to help her rebuild her life and hopefully get her record expunged and do those things, mechanisms that we now have here in the state of Florida so that someone who has been forced into this 
are, are put into a box where there is no other options. We're now giving them options where they can learn life skills, get a good job, go to nursing school, which is what she applied for. Go to nursing school, live her dream, because that's what she told me her dream was. This isn't my dream. Right. This is what I feel locked into. I really want to be a nurse. Right. Well, guess what? You get a chance to be a nurse now because what we can do is we can put you into services. We have mechanisms of hope, I call them, mm. where someone who is in despair can say, this doesn't have to be the end of the story. This may be the story right now, but there is hope ahead of this. Right. And the hope ahead of this can allow me to write a different ending to my life story than I thought was possible. And it's done because people care enough to do the heavy lifting to make sure that no one's left behind and no one should. Everybody deserves to live free. And until they're all free, we have to keep working. I just want to thank you, Marisol, for your heart to, to do this as well. And, and you don't need anybody else giving you accolades. Everybody knows on your audience, but you have a heart to do this. And I have learned that about you very quickly. And uh, love the work you do, love your heart, your passion, because it's going to take all of us to make this difference. But we can. I believe we can. I know. I, I'm still naive enough to believe that I, I we do too. can. We can do it. And it may take one life at a time, but we can do this. And I we agree. can do it together. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Please join us in this fight. Go to slaveryfreeworld.org and donate. Every amount helps. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you for listening to the Marisol Nichols podcast. And please do not forget to click like and subscribe. And a big shout out to WD Hahn for our theme song, Something's Gotta Change. See you next time.